بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ وصلاۃ وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ ما بعد اعوذ باللہ سمی الم شیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم وما ارسلنا کا اللہ رحمۃ اللہ عالمین وقال رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم لا یمن احد کم حت اخون احبہ علیہ من والدی و ولد ناسی اجمعین مائی رسپیکٹڈ برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز ٹوڈے آئی ہیو بین انوائٹیڈ بائی مسجد الحمیرا ان ایسٹ لنڈن to address a very, very important pressing issue of the Muslim Ummah in this age. And that issue is the crisis of Kashmir. Kashmir is a territory which is found or situated in northwestern India. And it is a vast territory which touches borders of China. Parts of it also touch Afghanistan. Some parts touch northern India and some parts, of course, have borders with current-day Pakistan. So it's a huge territory. It, only, it, it also touches borders of Tibet. So why are we talking about Kashmir? And why is history of Kashmir important? So today I will be talking about the history of Kashmir. For details, you will have to look at the books written by historians, academics, because details can simply not be given in a short lecture like this, but inshallah we will cover most important events that we need to know about Kashmir. Firstly, history is very important because history shows us what happened in the past. It helps us understand the present and it also helps us predict or possibly do better for the future. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to use history in the Quran as an argument. The Quran talks about a number of different nations, prophets, places, so that these incidents or events of the past can be used as examples to teach humanity to fix their future, if not the present. So look into the future by magnifying the history. So when you magnify history, you are effectively looking into the future. As they say, history repeats itself. Or, those who forget the history are condemned to relive it. So if you don't learn from your history, you will not be able to look forward to your future. So that's why history is very important and we are going to talk about the history of Kashmir and uh, surrounding areas. Kashmir is a conflict that is current Right now, as we speak, the people of Kashmir or the occupied Kashmir in India are under siege for the last two years or more. The people of Kashmir, the Muslims of Kashmir in particular, have been a severe lockdown. And I'm not talking about COVID-related lockdown. I'm talking about economic, medical, educational, business all sorts of lockdowns are imposed upon the, upon the Muslim population of Kashmir. And the reason is the historic background, which we will be talking about. Before we get to the crux of the matter, what's happening today and how it happened, or what caused the situation to be the way it is, we will go through the history of Kashmir very quickly as to the ancient period. Kashmir has experienced many, many different dynasty, dynasties. It has been ruled by many different rulers. And a detailed analysis of those dynasties and those rulers and their periods is not the purpose of this particular lecture, but I will mention them very quickly. So initially, in the ancient period, let's say um, Ashoka, who was a Buddhist king or emperor who had taken large territories of India. And Ashoka governed parts of northern India, southern India, western India and eastern India. And it was only in his time, for the first time, at least for the known history, when India was near united under one government. India was near united, not all of it. 
large parts of India were united under Ashoka. And this happened the second time under the rule of Aurangzeb Alamgir, the Mughal emperor, who ruled almost 95% of India. Aurangzeb, who was the most Islamic or Islamically observant, I must say, emperor of the Mughal empire. Emperor came before him and they came after him, but they were not as observant of Islam as he was. And for this reason, he is very much tarnished and hated and disliked by the right-wing extremist Hindu element in India today. The current Indian government is basically trying to wipe out that history of Aurangzeb Alamgir. Aurangzeb had conquered large chunks of India. So Ashoka had introduced Buddhism in, to Kashmir because he had conquered Kashmir and he was a great conqueror. So he had introduced Buddhism. So Buddhism became established. Later on, in the 5th, 6th and 7th century CE, Hindus came and they started to wipe out the Buddhists. Many Hindu king, kings and dynasties came and they started to simply um, wipe out Buddhist um, traces from the land of Kashmir. When I use the term Kashmir, by the way, I'm using it loosely because the borders of Kashmir are disputed to this day. No government, no political entity has yet agreed as to what exactly is Kashmir or how big, how big is it um, and where are the exact borders. Because parts of Kashmir are claimed by at least three countries. At least three countries. China claims parts of Kashmir. For example, the territory of Ladakh. China claims that territory. And there's a dispute between China and India. Pakistan claims Kashmir as its own because the majority population of Kashmir is Muslim. And by that virtue, Kashmir should have come to Pakistan after the partition of 1947, when the British left India. Then India, which is an occupying force today, Kashmir is the largest uh, militarized area in the world. There are, a, there are close to a million soldiers in Kashmir, in occupied Kashmir. Why we call it occupied Kashmir is because this is exactly what the Muslims of Kashmir, the majority population of Kashmir calls it. It is occupied territory, just like Palestine. It is occupied territory, right? So just like Palestine, Kashmir is another issue. So these Hindu kings in the 7th and the 6th and the 8th century, they completely wiped out traces of Buddhism. Buddhists were simply driven northwards into Tibet, China and Mongolia. And actually Buddhism was established in these lands later on in Tibet, China and Mongolia through Kashmir. It, it was Kashmiri missionaries who came from Kashmir who preached Buddhism in these lands. And then Buddhism became more established in Far East or let's say Southeast Asia and Central Asia than uh, the territory was born in. Buddha was born in Northern India, current day, let's say Nepal or parts of the, the borders of Nepal and India, right? And Buddha was Indian and Kashmir adopted uh, Buddhism as a religion. But then the Indian, uh, sorry, the Hindus, they came and they wiped out Buddhism from the territory of Kashmir. And by the way, this happened all over India. During the reign of Ashoka, uh, the dominant religion of India was Buddhism. So when this Hindutva narrative you hear all the time on the news that India is a Hindu domain. It has been so since uh, recorded history. This is a lie. This is a misconception. At one point, India was Buddhist. And then Buddhists were simply systematically wiped out by Hindu kings who came to power. In particular, the Brahmins, the priestly caste, uh, instigated these massacres and murders and you know genocides in some cases of Buddhists and Buddhists was systematically wiped out throughout India. 
And because Buddhists believed in a peaceful way of life, they found it difficult to fight back. Even when the Muslims came with Muhammad bin Qasim, rahmatullahi during the Umayyad period, they found Buddhists in India at that time. But later on, uh, the influence of the Buddhist uh, religious class was diminished. So Hindus came to power and different dynasties ruled the land of Kashmir up to the 14th century. We're talking about 1300s CE, 1300s. And I am fast forwarding this history so that we can get to the, the main issue, the conflict and what was what caused this conflict, which we find, find in Kashmir today. So Hindus more or less continued to govern. There was a Mongol invasion of Kashmir. By the way, Mongols went everywhere. Mongols attacked not only Syria and uh, parts of Central Asia, and Mongols went as far as Hungary, you know, in Europe. Mongols came to Pakistan and India as well. Mongols came very close to Lahore. Mongols even invaded Kashmir. So there was a Mongol invasion of Kashmir. And as a result, a Buddhist monk uh, came to power in the 14th century, precisely speaking. And after this Buddhist monk was allegedly converted to Islam, or he converted to Islam uh, himself, so says the legend, his vizier was called uh, Shah Mir. His name was Shah Mir and he ousted his ruler who was a Buddhist monk or an alleged convert to Islam. So Shah Mir became the first ruler of Kashmir, first Muslim ruler rather, sorry, first Muslim ruler of Kashmir. And his descendants and his dynasty, the Shah Mir dynasty lasted for almost another uh, 200 years and one of the reasons this dynasty came to power was heavy taxation and oppression that was taking place before this particular uh, period I mean uh, when Shah Mir came to power Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi in the in the 11th century also attempted to conquer Kashmir just like he conquered parts of India. He came from Ghazni, current day Afghanistan. Ghazni was a center of learning. There was a lot happening in Ghazni at that time. Even uh, some famous epics were written at his court. For example, the famous Shahname or that epic poem, the epitome of Persian literature was written at his court. And Abu Rayhan al-Bayruni who wrote a first systematic uh, treatment of the geography of India or the culture of India. I mean, his book is called Kitab al-Hind, the book of India. Abu Rehan al-Bayruni was a scholar active at the court of or in the court of uh, Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi and he was sent to gather information from India on India. So he came back with Kitab al-Hind. It's a very, very excellent treatment of uh, what was happening in India at the time, Indian religion, Indian culture and all that. So Mahmud Ghaznavi tried to invade Kashmir and he did not uh, conquer it. He wasn't able to conquer it. So he focused elsewhere. The Delhi Sultanate period, the Muslim rulers who were ruling the Delhi Sultanate, uh, starting from Sultan Muizzuddin, Shahabuddin Ghori, or Muhammad Ghori, also known as Muhammad Ghori, Muhammad bin Sam, his name was Muhammad bin Sam. He had taken large territory in northern India. In fact, the city of Delhi was taken by him. It was at that time or by that time ruled by a Hindu king called Prithvi Raj Chauhan. The Delhi Sultanate Sultans who governed or ruled this Sultanate after him, which governed large parts of northern India, and this was the first time in Indian history when Muslims came to power in northern India. Previously, Muslims were only in power in the south or let's say uh, southwest, uh, current day Sindh province of Pakistan or close to the territory of Multan or southern Punjab. This is how far the Muslims or the Arabs had come. So they governed this small territory within India. And even this territory was called Hind by the Arabs at the time. 
but it was a f fraction of Hind. The real powerhouse or uh, the real power of Muslims was established in India in the north through the Delhi Sultans. So Delhi Sultans also attempted uh, to take Kashmir but they were not able to do so. So after this dynasty in the 14th century was established by Shah Mir, a man called Shah Mir who was a Muslim, uh, he basically took power and for the next two years his children, his descendants ruled Kashmir uh, and this dynasty was called the Shah Mir dynasty, right? And then the Mughals came to power. How the Mughals came to power is very interesting as well. But before I talk about that, just want to mention that during this period of Shahmir dynasty, a lot of Sufis, preachers, wanderers, they came into Kashmir and they started preaching Islam. So in Kashmir, Islam started to take hold. So first, the population was Buddhist. Buddhism was wiped out. Then um, the cult of Shiva or Shaivism was introduced by Hindus. So people started to worship Shiva in the Kashmiri territory. So Shaivism okay, was the dominant religion before the Muslims started to emerge on the scene. So after Shahmir's dynasty or his taking of power, the people started to accept Islam from the 14th century onwards because a lot of Sufis and preachers uh, and these kind of characters were coming in and they were teaching their version of Islam, whatever the version of Islam was, because that was not really, strictly speaking, uh, uh, you know, the Quran and Sunnah, the Quran and Sunnah Islam. Uh, they were teaching a mixed Islam to the people of Kashmir at that time. So that's why people followed a mixture of uh, Islam and some Hindu traditions uh, and some other ideas, right? So this wasn't strictly speaking. Later on, no doubt, uh, when people had become Muslim, uh, they started to take knowledge from uh, scholars, orthodox scholars who started to come in, who started to teach, especially during the later Mughal, Mughal period and the Durrani period, which we'll be, talk, uh, we'll be talking about in due course, inshallah. So after the Shami dynasty, the Mughals came to power. Mughals took Kashmir. Uh, during the reign of Hamayun, the Mughal emperor, the second Mughal emperor, of India, Hamayun, during his reign, Kashmir was taken by one of his generals and coins in his name were minted in Kashmir. So you, you find coins minted in the name of Emperor Hamayun in Kashmir. But then that reign didn't last long because Hamayun was ousted by Sher Khan. This is not the Sher Khan of Jungle Book, right? I'm talking about Sher Khan was his real name was Farid Khan. He was an emperor. He was the ruler of India for almost seven years. And in the Indian history of Islam or the Islamic history of India, Sher Shah Suri, he was known as Sher Shah Suri, famously known later on as Sher Shah Suri, the Lion King Suri, right? His real name was Farid Khan. He was also called Sher Khan. Sher Shah Sultan, Sher Shah Suri, so he was known by different names. So he ruled from um, 1538, 1539 to 1545, about six to seven years. He had ousted, he was a general for the Mughals. He was an Afghan originally. He had ousted the second Mughal emperor, Hamayun, and the Mughals had almost lost the empire in India which was initially carved by the first Mughal emperor, Zahiruddin Babur. So, Sher Shah took power and after him his sons came to power. So, because Humayun was ousted, Kashmir was lost. Then, long story short, the Suris after Sher Shah was killed in a battle. The, uh, the, the deposits of gunpowder exploded and he was burnt as a result in a battle when he was trying to conquer a very, very difficult fortre fortress in Western India, sorry, Eastern India rather, Eastern India near Bengal and he was burnt 
as a result. So his son came to power and he couldn't hold on to power. Islam Shah Suri couldn't hold on to power. I mean, he ruled, but after him, his successors, they started to fight each other. So Humayun saw his chance again. He was taking refuge in Persia at the time. He came back and he conquered India, India again. And then he died soon after himself, after taking power back. He died, he fell from his library, uh, he fell from the staircase in his library and he died. His son Akbar, Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar, the famous Akbar, came to power. And then in 1580s, Kashmir was taken by him to remain in Muslim hands for the next 300 years. So Kashmir was ruled thenceforth for 300 years once the Mughals had taken Kashmir for Muslims again. So this happened in the 1580s when Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar had sent his armies and coins in his name were minted in the city of Srinagar. I have some of those coins in my possession, my personal collection where Muhammad Akbar's coins were minted in Srinagar, in the city of Srinagar, right? So thenceforth, Mughal emperors continued to govern Kashmir effectively and these emperors loved the territory of Kashmir. It was paradise on earth for them and no doubt Kashmir, the territory we're talking about is mountainous. It is absolutely beautiful. Anyone who has been to any parts of Kashmir, because Kashmir has a lot of variety of landscape, uh, you will, uh, if not forget Switzerland, you will do a comparison between Kashmir and Switzerland. This is how beautiful Kashmir is. You know, people talk about natural beauty in Switzerland. People talk about uh, highlands in Scotland. People talk about North Wales. Kashmir is no less. Wallahi, when you look at the natural beauty in Kashmir and the wildlife as well, is very, very rich. People hardly know about the virtues of Kashmir, how beautiful and how uh, healthy a territory it is. So the Mughal emperors, when uh, heat would get, get to them, they would simply pack their bags and they would make their way to Kashmir. It would take them a year to get there because Mughal entourage, uh, you know, the Mughal caravan was a moving city. So Emperor Jahangir was very fond of Kashmir. So was Shah Jahan and other rulers as well. Of course, Aurangzeb was a lot busier than the previous emperors because he had uh, opened many, many fronts for himself. So he uh, you know, didn't enjoy Kashmir as much, but the previous emperors were very much involved in Kashmir. So Kashmir remained a Muslim territory throughout the Mughal period. It remained a Muslim territory. And uh, uh, Mughal governors were appointed in Kashmir. And in this period, uh, Kashmir became a pioneer of many, many, many artistic, um, um, uh, how can I put it, trades, artistic uh, excellence uh, when it comes to, you know, artwork uh, in calligraphy, for example, uh, shawls, Kashmir shawls were very, very, very popular. Even later on during the British period, these shawls would be brought to Britain and during the Victorian period, the British people loved these shawls that came from Kashmir. You know this cloth called Kashmir? Have you heard of it? Even today, I mean, if you go to one of these uh, big shops to buy clothes or designer clothes, they have this type of uh, substance or this fabric, they call it Kashmir. This is where the word comes from, by the way. It's from Kashmir, right? So Kashmiris, they pioneered production of shawls. They have pioneered uh, decoration of manuscripts. If you collect manuscripts, if you look at books, some of the best artwork came from Persia. Persian artwork was beautiful. Persian calligraphy was beautiful. And Herat, which is currently Afghanistan, manuscript production from Herat was beautiful. And Kashmir was also on top with these uh, locations where people who would, uh, you know, decorate Islamic manuscripts uh, with gold illumination. So if you go on Google, this is your homework and type Kashmiri Quran Manuscript. Just type in Google Kashmiri Quran Manuscript, you will see some wonderful artwork from the Mughal period and beyond. 
So you will be blown away by the beauty of art you will see. So Kashmiris became excellent expert uh, artisans in many, many different fields. You know, whether it's fabric, whether it's construction, construct, construction of palaces and mosques and unfortunately tombs as well and other things. And they were writing books. Book production is very, very popular. You will see many, many Islamic manuscripts written in Kashmir, uh, Kashmir during this Muslim period, right? So Kashmir um, progressed very, very, very fast during the Mughal period. You can call it the golden age of Kashmir. The Mughal period was generally the golden age in India, although Hindutva goons and thugs will deny that. You know, so-called Hindutva historians you will see on Indian news channels, some of them, you laugh at them. And you, when they open their mouth, you think, who gave them their master or their PhD, first of all? And how did they even manage to get it? These people. One guy recently had the audacity to come on TV and say the Taj Mahal was built by the Hindus. It is a Hindu shrine. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's unbelievable how the kind of things people are coming up with, you know. So these Hindutva... Uh, activists, they are the ones who will deny things like this. But during the Mughal period, generally speaking, India, especially the peak period, during the reign of Jahangir, it started with Akbar, but during the reign of Jahangir, Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb, India was the most powerful. When I say India, I mean the Indian subcontinent. I don't mean current day India, right? I mean Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Nepal, and Sri Lanka put together, okay? All of this was India. Today, India is, of course, uh, is, is, is a country with borders, with defined borders. But during the Mughal period, India meant all of this land. So the Indian subcontinent was the, the most powerful territory in the world, economically, militarily, in some cases, educationally, intellectually. There was a lot happen happening in India. A lot of atheistic and, uh, you know, these Hindutva goons, they claim that what happened during the Mughal period? What did the Mughals do for India? So if you pick up serious histories written by serious historians, Western and otherwise, you will see that this was the most prosperous period in the history of India. Not only Kashmir. Kashmir, of course, was a beneficiary as a territory, but generally speaking, this period was the most prosperous uh, period in Indian history. When productions, trade, military uh, technology, schools, colleges, madaris, religious institutions, even Hindus prospered. You know, they call it the renaissance of the Sanskrit language. The reign of Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb, Sanskrit language, it took off. More literature was produced during this period than ever before in Sanskrit language. There is a historian called Audrey Trushk. She has written a book on this very topic. Culture of... Uh, um, I forgot the name of the book. Um, the subtitle is Sanskrit at the Mughal Court. Sanskrit at the Mughal Court by Audrey Trushk. Culture of Encounters. Culture of Encounters, Sanskrit at the Mughal Court. She talks about it in her book. And because she is writing history, not favoring the Mughals, not painting the Mughals as heroes or angels, she is simply writing history. She does history. Because she is simply writing history, she is the biggest villain or one of the biggest villains in India today. She gets pestered every single day, day and night. She gets, um, what's the word, uh, trolled. She gets trolled by Hindutva as if they have a team of Hindutva uh, employees just to pester her on Twitter. And she's a very strong lady. She has produced a lot of good works on history. Uh, and she doesn't favor the Mughals. She doesn't paint the Mughals as if they were angels. So Kashmir prospered during the Mughal period, benefited immensely from the Mughals and their effective governing. After the demise or the death of Aurangzeb Alamgi Rahmatullahi Alay, who governed for nearly 50 years. Aurangzeb Alamgir 
passed away in 1707. After his death, the Mughals couldn't hold on to power. Aurangzeb had created a large domain in India, largest territory ever conquered by any Mughal king. So 95% of India came uh, under his uh, rule. He went as far as Tamil Nadu, you know, Tamil regions in southern India. And he was fighting the Marathas. And he also conquered two Shia dynasties in the south. He felt threatened by them, Bijapur and Golconda, because both of these uh, dynasties were threatening Aurangzeb and his domain um, by using the Persian emperor as a threat. So he removed them from power and then he took hold of southern India also. So after his passing away, after he died, his children, his descendants could not hold on to power because they were not as able or as dedicated or as um, effective as him as rulers. So his son ruled for another five years from 1707 to 1712, Shah Alam I. He died and... After he died, all hell broke loose in India. Okay, you had the Persian invasion of 1739 during the reign of Muhammad Shah, a weak Mughal emperor who spent more time smoking hookah, watching dances, and uh, you know playing with hawks and hunting. You know, then he governed. Then he had time to rule, and then later on. Uh, it was a disaster. It was a grand catastrophe. And the Mughals became a laughing stock, unfortunately, politically speaking. Militarily, the Mughals had lost their influence. The Sikhs rose in Punjab, in the Punjab region. The Sikhs started to rebel in the Punjab region. The Marathas came from central India and they started taking large territory in the north. And the Persian, uh, the Persian ruler at the time, uh, Nadir Shah Afshar, he invaded uh, India from Persia because allegedly he was influenced or encouraged by some of the Indian nobles to invade India uh, because of sectarian divide because there were some nobles who were Shia in India and uh, Mughals were Sunni predominantly right so some Shia nobles from India invited uh, the Persian king to invade India this is the time this is the time to strike this is the weakest period in the Mughal history. So billions of pounds worth jewelry, manuscripts, furniture, pottery, you name it. Delhi was a center of civilization. Okay, for almost 500 years, no one could look at Delhi, let alone touch it. I will repeat, politically, militarily, okay, Delhi, the city of Delhi, from the year 1200. Remember the year 1200 in your minds, right? From the year 1200 to 1700, 500 years. No one could even look at Delhi or think of Delhi, let alone touch it or invade it. But unfortunately, that Roab or that uh, powerhouse was compromised in the latter or oh, sorry, the latter part of the first uh, half of the 18th century uh, when the Persian ruler Nadir Shah invaded in 1739 and he devastated the city of Delhi. This is when Kohenur, the famous diamond, was lost to the Persians. Uh, the Mughal throne, the peacock throne, the famous peacock throne was broken up. It was taken by the Persians and the Mughals lost their power. Obviously, that would affect Kashmir as well as a territory because Kashmir was Mughal territory. Um, so subsequent emperors continued to rule Kashmir uh, nominally, at least in name. Uh, and some rulers or governors, they announced their independence. So many different dynasties were born due to the Mughal weakness at center. So you had the Marathas, the Sikhs and the Nizam of Hyderabad, Nizam Asif Jah. He announced his independence because he had no choice, because the center was weak. There was no powerful general or ruler to bring everyone together, right? Now, Duranis come into scene. Duranis were rulers who came from Afghanistan. Their head or the founder was Ahmad Shah 
Abdali. Ahmad Shah Abdali was a soldier in the Persian army when Nadir Shah invaded India, Hindustan at that time in 1739. Ahmad Shah was a young man at the time, right? And don't forget the Pashtun tribes in this region, in the tribal regions of Pakistan and bordering areas of Afghanistan or wherever the Pashtuns exist in Afghanistan. One of the famous occupation of the Pashtuns at that time was to become mercenaries, to offer their military services to anyone who paid. Okay, but at the same time, Pashtuns were Muslims, Sunni Muslims, and uh, they had Ghira for Islam as well. At, at times, they did fight for Hindus, they did fight for Sikhs, they fight, fought for others, the Mughals, they fought for Mughals, Mughals would take their services. So these Pashtun soldiers from the time, you would see them walking around in the market, markets of India offering the services as guards. Okay, a lot of people would argue nothing much has changed even today, you know. Most Chokidars, most guards in Pakistan, yeah, they are Pashtuns because they're tough people. You will see most guards, I'm not saying the Pashtuns are only for that work because our Prime Minister in Pakistan is a Pashtun as well. You know, Imran Khan is a Pashtun, right? So a lot of people, they think Pashtuns are for that kind of hard work, you know, hard labor. But this is what they were known for. They were, they were a martial race, right? They were good in military. So Ahmad Shah, he was a Pashtun who was serving Nadir Shah, but then he separated himself after Nadir Shah was killed in his tent in 1747. In 1747, Nadir Shah, the ruler of Persia, was killed in his tent. And Ahmad Shah, who had become very close to Nadir Shah by then, he occupied or somehow got his hands on the treasure. He get, basically, he was able to capture the treasure of Nadir Shah, Nadir Shah, or parts of it at least. And because of that treasure, he was able to raise an army of his own. Cut the long story short, he announced his independence and he became the ruler of Afghanistan. He became the ruler of Afghanistan. And his capital was Kandahar. He ruled much of Afghanistan. If you look at his coins, his coins were minted at Kabul. His coins, actually he even ruled parts of Persia. Even parts of Iran were ruled by him. You will find coins of Ahmad Shah Abdali minted in Mashhad. Mashhad Muqaddas, which is a holy city for the Shia. Ahmad Shah, who was a Sunni, his coins were minted at Mashhad, in Mashhad. I have them in my possession, by the way, in case you think I'm making these, these things up here. Yeah? So, Ahmad Shah ruled a large territory and he invaded India. Uh, many times, for the same reason, to gain wealth to take advantage of the weak situation there. He was a king. Kings are usually scavengers. You know, they, they go into other territories when they want to get rich, they want to get wealth. But one time, he did something great for the Muslims. And what was that? To break the back of the rising Maratha power. I'm coming to Kashmir, by the way, in, in case you think I've gone into another history now. The history of Di history of Duranis is being told. No, Duranis are directly relevant to Kashmir. That's why I'm just giving you a very quick background to that. So, uh, when India was invaded by the Persians in 1739, the situation of Delhi was made very weak. Now the Marathas were invading. Marathas captured the city of Delhi. So Marathas from central India, they started to come to the north and they were devastating villages, towns, cities, burning, pillaging, raping. Uh, you know, they were the most devastating force in the history of India, by the way. Okay, today, nowadays, Bollywood, Bollywood glorifies them as heroes, as angels, as some sort of heaven, heavenly divine beings who landed from the heavens and they made India a beacon of light and civilization. In fact, to the contrary, the Marathas were the most devastating, dangerous, deadly force India ever witnessed. Witnessed for Hindus, for Sikhs, for Christians and for Muslims. For everyone. They didn't care. They didn't care. They raped, pillaged, destroyed with impunity, without mercy. This is what the Marathas were doing. Right? When you watch Bollywood movies, you are shown a completely distorted version of the Marathas. 
For example, in the, the movie called Panipat, which is what I'm going to talk about, the Battle of Panipat, the third Battle of Panipat in 1761, why did it take place? Because the Marathas were coming to the north. Whenever they felt, felt like pillaging and they were short of money or something, they would come and they would charge a choth. Choth is basically one-fourth of the wealth or the income of the people. So if you have a harvest, they would take 25% of it. They were very, very, very... Uh, harsh with people uh, they went as far as Bengal they went, they came into Punjab they even occupied Lahore they went as far as Atak Pakistan near Peshawar the Marathas took Atak right so to deal with them Ahmad Shah was invited by the Muslims of India in particular Shah Waliullah who was a scholar in Delhi he is uh, given credit for this uh, this is another history I had We'll stop here and I will address the Battle of Panipat and the Duranis in another sitting. But now I will move on to the issue of Kashmir, how Duranis are relevant to Kashmir. So Ahmad Shah defeated the Marathas in this battle, which took place in 1761 near Delhi in a place called Panipat. And the Marathas were broken, destroyed, decimated. For the next 20 years, the Marathas did not return uh, to pester the northern uh, people of northern India. When Ahmad Shah had defeated the Marathas, naturally his domain had increased within India. So he occupied Kashmir as well. The Duranis occupied Kashmir. So Ahmad Shah's coins were minted in Kashmir, Kashmiri territory from Mughals. It was shifted into the hands of Duranis. So Duranis were very, very harsh on the Hindu population of Kashmir, no doubt. They imposed heavy taxes. And um, this caused a lot of resentment uh, within the Hindu population. The majority of the people in Kashmir by now, by the Durrani period, close to 80% like they are today. I mean, the ratio survives to this day, amazingly. Uh, 70 to 80% of the population of Kashmir, occupied Kashmir, to this day is Muslim. The majority of the Kashmiri people are Muslims, right? 20 to 25 percent are Hindu, uh, mostly Brahmins, Hindu Pandits they are called and they have uh, lived together with the Muslims since then. So the Duranis came to power and Duranis ruled for the next three generations effectively. Ahmad Shah, after him came his son Taimur Shah in whose name coins were minted in Kashmir. Again Kashmir, loosely speaking, territory between Ladakh and uh, parts of northern India is a huge territory it's a huge territory Jammu and Kashmir both territories Jammu was of course at that time seen as separate later on it was united with Kashmir why I will be discussing that inshallah so Duranis ruled for three generations and then in the 19th century due to the weakness in the Durrani ruling system because it was a tribal type of system you know because Duranis were tribal Pathans, Pashtuns, right? So they're ruled by the tribal system. So Ahmad Shah died, his son Taimur Shah came to power, he was able to keep them united. But after Taimur Shah died, his sons fought and different tribes supported different sons. So there was Shah Zaman, there was Mahmud Shah, and uh, there were other children of Ahmad Shah who were involved and they all wanted the piece, uh, a piece of the pie, right? And that caused the weakening of power at the center, right? So Kashmir was compromised. At this same time, now we are moving very close to the current conflict and why it was caused and how did we get here? How did we even get here where, the, where, where Kashmir is today, where the situation is today? In 1819, a Sikh ruler who had taken large parts of the Punjab. As I mentioned earlier, when Mughals declined, the Sikhs, they started to rise and they started to take large territories. So Punjab, loosely speaking, was governed by 10 groups of Sikhs. They called them missiles. They called them missiles. 10 missiles of the Sikhs governed uh, most of Punjab. And they also call them Jatha. Jatha means a collection of people. Okay. It's like a Jaish. 
It's like a jaysh in the Arabic language or a lashkar. Ten lashkars or ten uh, military groups of Sikhs ruled Punjab. So, a man called Ranjit Singh was born in Gujranwala, current day Gujranwala in Pakistan near Lahore. And this territory was ruled by the Sikhs at the time. And cut the long story short, he came to power when he was nearly 19, 20 years old. He took the city of Lahore from one of the Sikh groups that was notoriously uh, cruel. Uh, the population appealed to this, uh, um, this uh, leader of another group to come and help us. So Ranjit Singh took Lahore and when he took Lahore, he became more confident. He started to take territory throughout Punjab. He took territory as far as Peshawar, from Peshawar to Multan, believe it or not, was ruled by Sikhs for nearly 50 years, for nearly 50 years. From 1799 to 1839, Maharaja Ranjit Singh ruled territory from Peshawar to Multan. And Kashmir was also taken in 1819. In 1819, Kashmir was taken from the Duranis because Dura Duranis by now were wavering. And very, very unfortunate for the Duranis, two of the grandsons of Ahmad Shah Abdali took refuge with Ranjit Singh in Lahore and he brutalized them. He treated them very, very badly. He imprisoned them. They were under house arrest. They couldn't leave. And uh, Ranjit Singh was told that the Durrani family, the royal family, has the Kohenur, the diamond. He was a very greedy ruler. Uh, most rulers are greedy, no doubt. Okay, but he was excessively greedy, Maharaja Ranjit Singh. He wanted the Kohenur in his treasury. So he forced the Durrani royal family. Uh, he searched the apartments, the private chambers where women were. The Sikh soldiers went in there and they searched the whole house or wherever the, the family was kept in Lahore. And they found the Kohenur. Okay, so Durrani's were themselves taking refuge with the Sikhs at the time. So Maharaja Ranjit Singh took advantage, conquered the territory of Kashmir, even though the, the majority of the population was Muslim. So he appointed governors after governors. And after the first Anglo-Mysore, sorry, Anglo-Sikh war, which took place in 1846. 1846, after Maharaja Ranjit Singh died in 1839, his sons could not hold on to power. They were killed one after another, okay. And in 1846, uh, the British decided that they will annex Punjab. Punjab is a rich territory, the land of five rivers, very, very fertile, only second to Bihar, Orissa and Bengal. So Punjab must be taken as a breadbasket for the empire. For the British Raj and its survival, the Punjab is absolutely must. We have to take it by hook or by crook. And Sikhs were very much trained by now. They were organized as a military, so it was not an easy task to take the ter territory of Punjab from the Sikhs. So the Sikhs were defeated in this battle uh, called the First uh, Anglo-Sikh War. There were two. There was another one later on, two to three years later, but this was the first one, 1846. And as a result of this battle, the British, they signed a treaty with the Raja of Jammu, who was a Hindu, Dogra. These people were called Dogras. Okay, the, the caste or the nation was called Dogras. The Dogra Rajas of Jammu, who were active at the court of Ranjit Singh. They were vessels of Ranjit Singh now, because Ranjit Singh is gone, he's dead, and the situation looks grim. So the Raja of Jammu, Gulab Singh, bought, bought, having paid money, uh, 7 million rupees. Today, 7 million rupees is nothing. Satar lakh rupiah, right? It's nothing. You can't even buy a plot in Islamabad or, or Rawalpindi with that kind of money, right? Right. But that, that time, 70 million rupees was a lot of money. A lot of money. So the British sold the territory of Kashmir, not Jammu, the territory of larger Kashmir to Maharaja Gulab Singh, the Dogra family, right? Uh, and they were Hindus and they were very active in the court of Ranjit Singh. In fact, they, they were involved in many, many court intrigues as well. So now Kashmir was given to a Hindu Raja to rule. From Sikhs, from Duranis, it, was, it came under the Sikhs. From Sikhs, it came under the, the Dogra family. 
and then the Dogras, they started to oppress the Muslim population severely because they felt threatened by the Muslims of Kashmir because they were the majority and the Dogras were Hindu who were ruling uh, a large Muslim territory. So to do away with the threat, they started to impose heavy taxes upon the Muslims to keep them poor, to keep them subdued, to keep them miskeen. So that they, they don't rise. They don't even think of rising. They are so worried about their stomachs and their kitchen and their food that they don't even think of rising. So the Muslims are systematically marginalized politically, educationally, on all fronts by the Dogras. They oppressed the Muslim masses. Fast forward to the British period. Now, the Dogras, by extension, because the treaty was struck between the Dogras and the British after the Sikhs had been defeated, so that, that territory was given to the Dogras. Maharaja Gulab Singh. So now, the Dogras effectively became vessels of the British. The British were now basically uh, the overruling power. You know, the British were supervising the Dogras. The Dogras had their semi-independence within Kashmir and Jammu. So this state became the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The state of Jammu and Kashmir ruled by a Hindu family. So the British were obviously uh, supervising the Dogras and the Dogras were allies and during the mutiny of 1857 when the, the, the Indian um, soldiers within the British army they rose in rebellion and they, uh, they mutinied and the British almost lost their power. Uh, it is also called Jange Azadi, the War of Independence 1857 or from the British perspective at that time it was called the Indian Mutiny. It's also called Ghadar. Ghadar means rebellion basically, right? It was a huge rebellion which almost completely uh, uh, diminished the British Raj, you know, uh, there were Hindu soldiers and there were Muslims and all of them, they united under uh, albeit weak leadership of Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last nominal Mughal emperor who was only a nominal emperor by then. He was just a puppet receiving uh, a stipend, monthly stipend by the British by then because the British had occupied the city of Delhi in 1803 having defeated the Marathas because the Marathas had the city before the British came to power and the Muslims thanked Allah that the British came to power and the Marathas are gone because they were so oppressive. So, um, long story short, the British had given the territory of Jammu and Kashmir to uh, this family and when in 1947, the time for partition came, one of the grand, uh, great-grandchildren of Maharaja Gulab Singh, who initially took the land of Kashmir from the British, he was ruling, his name was Hari Singh. Hari Singh was ruling the territory of Jammu and Kashmir, albeit as a vessel of the British. He was very close to the British. And uh, at that time, Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, engaged him and advised him to surrender Kashmir to Pakistan. Now we are coming to the current conflict, how we ended up in this situation today. So he advised Maharaja Hari Singh, Dogra, to surrender Kashmir to Pakistan because the population is 70% Muslim. It only makes sense for Kashmir to come to Pakistan because Pakistan is for Muslims and the rest of India is um, technically for Hindus and others. So he was not too sure. He was in two minds and he wanted to wait and see what happens. Because India had its independence on the 15th of August 1947 or the independence was announced then and Pakistan announced in its independence for the British rule after a rule of nearly um, uh, almost 300 years um, and then a lot of princely states, semi-independent princely states were one after another annexed by either Pakistan or India. For example, in India the state of Hyderabad was a Muslim state ruled by uh, the family or the children of Nizam, right? That state was annexed by India. Sardar Patel, he sent his armies 
and uh, the military of Hyderabad was defeated. He, and he was the richest man in the world. Uh, Nizam Uthman, he was the richest man in the world and all that treasury came to India. Likewise, the state of Bahawalpur in Pakistan was eventually annexed by Pakistan. So the state of Kashmir was a similar, similar princely state, semi-independent. Semi uh, Jinnah engaged him and it was very likely that Hari Singh would have agreed. But a rebellion started in Kashmir. Muslims started to fight. Some Pashtuns from the tribal area of Pakistan, they ended up in Kashmir and they, they fought. And when they fought, uh, Hari Singh, he started to fear for his position. He didn't want to lose the territory to these Pashtun tribes or a mixture of fighters coming from uh, Pakistani, different Pakistani territories, even some Punjabis were there. So uh, a lot of Muslim volunteers, uh, they ended up in Kashmir fighting the Dogras. Uh, Dogras were hated anyway by the population. So Hari Singh felt pressured. So he quickly in a hurry, Hari Singh in a very, very hurry, you know, he signed a treaty with, uh, uh, with uh, who was the ruler of India at the time, uh, Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru, who, was, uh, who became the ruler of India. So Mountbatten agreed with this uh, idea and Kashmir was basically given against the wishes of the people of Kashmir to India. So, some territory was taken from the Dogras, which is today called Azad Kashmir. So, your Mirpur, your Ravlakot, your Muzaffarabad was basically Dogra territory before the partition. It was taken by volunteers. A lot of this territory, which is current day Kashmir in Pakistan or the independent Kashmir, Azad Kashmir was Dogra territory. And it was taken by the volunteers. So you can say the third of Kashmir was taken at that time. And the third of Kashmir belongs to Pakistan. The rest, two thirds you can say, or more than half the territory is occupied by India against the wishes of the people. So the Kashmiri territory was given a special state st status due to its controversial uh, circumstances. United Nations got involved in 1948 and 1949. A lot of discussions took place. Uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, he said, we will do a, a referendum and let the Kashmiri people decide. But the volunteers have to leave the territory they have occupied. But the volunteers and Pakistan uh, was refusing. Why? Because what is the guarantee that once they leave, uh, this territory will be uh, also occupied. So let's do a referendum without... So this back and forth of ideas, this back and forth of argumentation, it wasted a lot of time. And uh, Pakistan and India had three wars due to occupied Kashmir. The first war was in 1965. In, 19, in 1962, China invaded Ladakh and took a large territory in Ladakh and China was encouraging Pakistan to do the same, invade Kashmir and we can together take this land. India is pressed against the wall. China was fighting India already in 1962. So China advised Pakistan to do it and Pakistani leadership decided not to do it. But the war still went ahead three years later in 18, sorry, 1965. There was a war between uh, India and Pakistan and uh, uh, then there was another war in 1971 as a result, uh, Bengal, which was East Pakistan. Current day Pakistan was called West Pakistan and Bengal or Bangladesh was called East Pakistan. Uh, although this divide between the two parts of the same country was not advised ideal situation because between Bangladesh and uh, Pakistan or current day Pakistan, there is India, right? And it was going to happen eventually. Okay, sooner or later, this divide would have taken place. This breaking apart would have taken place. But India took advantage of some of the communal issues going on between the Bengalis and the West Pakistanis because West Pakistanis were seen to be discriminating against or that was the perception in Bengal at the time. In Bengal, people... And some politicians, of course, took advantage of that sentiment in Bengal or Bangladesh, current day Bangladesh, and they aroused the sentiments of the Bengali people that 
West Pakistan discriminates against you. Politically, you are marginalized and you will not get your way. So break apart. So uh, a movement was started in 1971. India took advantage of that movement and Bangladesh broke away from West Pakistan. So West Pakistan became Pakistan and East Pakistan became Bangladesh as a result of 1971 war. Another war took place in 1999 where Pakistani military had captured a very strategic point uh, in a place called Kargil, very, very close to Ladakh territory. And uh, it would have been a successful, uh, as far as the Pakistani military was concerned, it would, it would have been a successful venture, but it was thwarted by the politicians at the time and they had to leave territory. They had to uh, basically leave that territory and as a result, many, many casualties occurred. Many people were killed from both sides. Okay, Pakistan, of course, took uh, heavy losses as uh, uh, the retreat was taking place. So, Pakistan and India are to this day seen as enemies of each other. They are both nuclear powers and the reason they are nuclear powers is Kashmir. Conflict. Sometimes conflict makes nations strong or stronger, right? If you look at human history, you will see that those nations who got involved in conflicts, they started to make fast progress. Look at the Greeks and the Persians, right? Uh, look at the Romans, for example. Later on, uh, look at the Muslim empire, how Muslims, uh, when they were in conflict with the Persians and the Romans, uh, they made very, very fast progress, militarily speaking. Of course, the Muslims had the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet behind to inspire them, but conflict has something to do with it. So the reason why India and Pakistan are nuclear powers is because of Kashmir. They felt the need to build these weapons so that they can defend each other, sorry, defend um, themselves against each other. So this is the long story short, the history of Kashmir and the current conflict. There are many, many, many more details I could have given. Unfortunately, the time doesn't permit me to do so. This was a very, you can say, brief or a short introduction to the history of Kashmir and the current conflict. It is there and Kashmir is occupied. The Indian military is occupying Kashmir against the wishes of the people. The people of Kashmir, the occupied Indian side Kashmir I'm talking about, not Pakistani side, because there is no occupation there. The people of Muzaffarabad or the people of Mirpur or the people of Ravlakot or the people of other cities on the Pakistani side are not fighting the military. On the Indian side, the people of Kashmir, they hate the Indian military, they hate the Indian politics and they hate the occupation. Why does India need to keep close to a million soldiers in a small or relatively small, comparatively speaking, territory? Why? Because they want to maintain this occupation. It is costing hundreds of millions of dollars to the Indian state for keeping these soldiers in this place. Why? There is a rule in human history that if you are not loved by the people, you will never occupy them. Sooner or later, your occupation will face defeat. You will have to retreat. You will have to go home. You will not be able to occupy unless you make friends with the people, unless you treat them justly, unless you give them what they want. Look at the Muslims. When Muslims took land between China to Morocco, Muslims are still there to this day. People accepted Islam. They were not forced into Islam. They were not. The Muslim civilization opened doors for Christians, for Buddhists, for Hindus, for Jews. The Jews say that their golden age was under the house of Islam. The Jewish golden age was in Al-Andalus, precisely speaking. The best scholars in Jewish history, the best poets, the best intellectuals, the best theologians were produced in Spain under the domain of Islam. When Muslims were ruling Spain. And likewise, 
other nations and other people. So how is it that Islam still survives from Morocco to China? Because Islam immersed people. Even the Mongols who came out to break, break Islam and Islamic spirit. Even the Mongols were defeated by Islam. Not by the Muslims, no doubt. The Mongols were a very powerful, devastating force. Mongols were unstoppable for some time. But later on, they themselves became Muslims. They became the defenders of this faith. The Mongols, in many cases. In fact, some claim that the Mughals were direct descendants of Mongols through Taimur. Taimur, Amir Taimur, who was ruler, a Central Asian ruler who had some Mongol descent. So long story short, what India is doing in Kashmir today is going to end sooner or later. You cannot, unless you commit a genocide, unless you nuke the people of Kashmir and kill them all. You can't do that. India cannot do that. You cannot sustain an occupation like that. Economically, culturally, historically, India and her generals and politicians, not the people. India is a beautiful place. India has some amazing people in it. Some amazing intellectual scholars, just people, upright people, moral people in India. So when I say India, I don't mean the Indian people. I mean those politicians and those generals who are brutally occupying a territory against the wishes of a people. And this occupation will be lifted sooner or later. So in 2019, the current government, the BJP government of India, the terrorist, extremist and... Uh, the, the destructive government of India, which is bent upon breaking India apart into further 10 pieces, you know, because they are messing with the Sikhs, they are upsetting the Muslims, they are upsetting the Christians, they are upsetting almost every Indian. Even their own followers now have realized that this is a bunch of terrorists and extremists who have come to power. Some of them are known criminals who have come to power. They have made speeches encouraging their followers to commit a genocide of the Muslims. Right? This government has imposed a lockdown on the Kashmiri people. And since 2019, Kashmiri people have been under this severe lockdown. And uh, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberate the people of Kashmir. And we pray that the, the government of the current government of India, the current government of India um, is brought back to senses and this issue is resolved as soon as possible. We want peace for the world, not injustice and destruction. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep this world peaceful and allow the people of Kashmir to live as they wish. Jazakumullah khairan for listening. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.